that. Oh, it's gone. Is it? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. If this is your first time here, there are restrooms that are in the other side of the building. If you go through the kitchen area that way, uh, to the other side of the building, there are also exits there as well. I'm now turning it over to Adam and Joe. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How are we this morning? Good. Wonderful. How are you? I'm great. Charlie. All right. All right. So I'm going to start the service with a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, so welcome to First Parish Kingston Unitarian Universalist. Uh, we collectively acknowledge that First Parish is located on the unceded, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Wampanoag people. Uh, we acknowledge the Mashpee, Aquina, Herring Pond, and Assinit uh, Wampanoag tribes as the original protectors and stewards of this land and the surrounding waters. Uh, we recognize the perpetual uh, detrimental effects that systemic governmental oppressions have had on the indigenous communities as a result of colonization. We come here to learn and to listen and to start a conversation. And now Adam will light the chalice with humility and courage born of our history we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings. And the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. So right now we're going to um, play some opening music uh, that James is pulling up right now. Um, this is known as the uh, Calame Dance. Uh, it's a traditional long uh ceremonial dance. So whatever you're ready, James. Um, and I just wanted to kind of put us um, Back in time, 400 or 500 years. Did you stay in a place made out of seven shit making things? I'll take it from you. After this brief one, you must be places. <laughs>
the service for our Candles of Community. And before I go forward with that, I just want to remind folks that this service is being recorded. Thank you so much to Brenda. And it will be shown on YouTube channels of First Parish Plymouth and First Parish Kingston. However, this part of the service will not be shown on YouTube. This is a chance for you to come forward if you'd like. If you have a joy or a concern you'd like to share, please come forward, tell us your name, and briefly say what's on your mind so we might share in it. And you can also light a silent candle if you wish, and Adam can help you with that if you wish. My name is Paula Fisher, and I'm a member of this First Parish Kingston. And uh, last week, um, we lost a true Plymouth historian. Uh, not only did he delve into the Plymouth story here, but hugely in Leiden, Holland, where he lived, and also has re had recently written more information about the Wampanoag relationship. His name was Jeremy Bangs. He was a curator at Plymouth, Patuxa, Plymouth Plantation then, Plymouth Patuxa Museums now, and I work there. And my husband and I were fortunate enough to go visit he and his wife in Leiden, Holland last year. Um, and uh, anyway, I think it was, it was called non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma, which, if, okay, I've heard of the non, but not the non-non. Anyway, so Jeremy struggled through it for years, and we were just so pleased to be able to have met him and gone through the Leiden Museum last year. Uh, and he did, he passed away about a week ago now. So there will be a service for him. This is a reading from the book God is Read by Vine Deloria Jr., who's a Native American activist, scholar. It is not what people believed to be true that was important, but what they experienced as true. Hence, revelation was seen as a continuous process of adjustment to natural surroundings and not a specific message related for all times and places. And now it's time, now it's time for the offering. We know you have a lot of choices when it comes to donating. We ask that you give as you are able this morning, and we promise to be responsible stewards of your gift. The music playing will be Wampanoag, People of the First Black, by Joey Curtin and Mark Cooper.
I really want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend. Um, so appreciate everyone coming. Um, I titled this talk, uh, Patuxent Kingston, A Land Unacknowledged, A Legacy Worth Reclaiming. Um, before I get into all of that, uh, what do I mean by Patuxent Kingston? And what is Patuxent for that matter? Um, Patuxent. <coughs> was a uh, territory of the Wampanoag tribe extended from uh, North River in Marshfield um, to south of Plymouth Bay, as far west as the Pembroke Ponds um, in today's towns of Pembroke, Plimpton, Halifax, and Hanson. Um, so it was a territory within the Wampanoag tribe, um, and the people in that territory uh, represented like a federation within Massasoit's government. Um, and the members of Patuxet sat on his council at the Wampanoag headquarters in present day Bristol, Rhode Island. And from time to time, Massasoit would travel down to visit Patuxet um, to stay at his vacation home, which was at Montpontic Ponds in Halifax. So um, this, that whole area was Patuxet, but what is Patuxet Kingston? Um, the area of Kingston didn't really exist as its own entity back then, um, but at the same time, this land um, area had a distinct role in the lives of the Patuxent people. Um, so I'll focus on that today in order to sort of take us back in time to see what our town would have looked like 400, 500 years ago. So uh, Patuxent families would have moved to the Kingston area in the spring around uh, March. Uh, because Kingston, Patuxet was the home to their summer planting grounds. And March was usually the beginning of their planting season. Um, but how did the Patuxet time their annual move to Kingston? Uh, they didn't have a written calendar. They actually had a more accurate way of uh, timing their planting, um, which was in accordance to when the con constellation Pleiades disappeared from the western horizon and reemerged in the east as well as when the herring started being seen in the rivers and when buds started growing in the trees. So that meant it was time to pack up and move to Kingston. Uh, from early March to late June, everyone set up their houses in the Jones River lowlands of Kingston, so like Bay Farm Conservation Area. Um, some of you are familiar with that. That was one of their planting villages. Um, so everyone settled around Bay Farm, started planting. Um, they worked the soil with clam shells. Um, and set up mounds to grow corn, beans, and squash. <coughs> so these, these fields needed a lot of maintenance until about late June. Um, so the village lived around the bay farm, corn fields, and collaborated together to make sure the crops got through this early stage. But um, while the crops were in the early stages, the Patuxet relied mostly on seafood that they would um, catch and procure from the Kingston area. So that, the Elm Street Bridge, which is um, right down, like a few, you know, right down there. Um, <laughs> many of you know it. Uh, the, the Elm Street Bridge used to be the um, biggest fish weir in town. A fish weir was a, a giant net uh, that men would sew out of locally grown hemp and it would catch, uh, they'd place it at spots of the Jones River where they could catch the most herring. Um, and at Rocky Nook, also, Wampanoag uh, women uh, would dig for clams at low tide, and then um, if it was high tide, would wade uh, and dive in for quahogs, and would dive into sort of calm and even rough waters to catch lobsters for their husbands to use as bait while fishing. Um, so if you were around Kingston in the summer, all this activity is what you'd see. Um, so Kingston. In, in Kingston Bay, also, men would go nighttime on night fishing trips. Uh, they'd catch flounder, skate, and dogfish um, using uh, torches and spears um, in canoes. And um, but so this is how the, the community kind of sustained itself while the corn was in its early stages of growing. Um, by the time June came to a close, though, the fields would have been the fields at Bay Farm would have been pretty much all set. Uh, the corn stalks would have been up um, five or six feet tall. They would have acted as um, a bean pole for the kidney beans. So the 
and the squash vines would have protected the bottom of the corn plants and the bean plants from pests and weeds and preserve soil moisture. Um, and the beans would naturally be good for the soil because they're nitrogen fixating, um, meaning they produce much needed nutrients for soil fertility. So it was all like a really uh, efficient way of growing food. Um, and by the time, you know, June rolled around, uh, every, everything was all in place. The families in the Tuxedo Kingston could relax and kind of enjoy the rest of the summer, dispersing to different neighborhoods um, in Kingston, which were based around uh, natural bodies of water. So um, ponds and streams in Kingston were great places to catch, you know, fish, waterfowl, wild game. Um, so from July to September, that's where families would, would live. And um, what we would call like neighborhoods today, that's what these water bodies and waterways um, were to the Patoxid. Um, so there was like a neighborhood on the south shore of the Smelt Pond near Kingston Collection Mall. Um, there's a neighborhood on the coast of Foundry Pond behind uh, Patuxet, Park, Patuxet Park off of 3A near the Charlie Horse. And uh, there were neighborhoods all along the Jones River. Um, there's a neighborhood on the shore of Silver Lake. And there was a neighborhood near Lucas Pond, which is behind Brook Street, um, kind of close to here. So, um, and there was probably one right near here, near um, the Elm Street Bridge. Um, so. Instead of driving to your friend's house, um, like 500 years ago, you would hop in your canoe and paddle down the Jones River or Smelt Brook um, to go see your friends because their neighborhood would always be right next to a body of water that was accessible by canoe. Um, the, but they did have uh, walking trails, and the main roads we now have going through Kingston were actually all a types of trails. Uh, so Route 106 was the road connecting Patuxet to the rest of the Wampanoag tribe. Um, and so if you, if you had business in the uh, Wampanoag headquarters down in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island, you'd travel down 106 uh, to Rhode Island. Um, if you, so Route 27 was a walking trail that led to the Pembroke Ponds, which was the um, tribe's winter home. And uh, Route 3A, Crescent Street, Landing Road, Allen Lane, School Street, Brookdale, Evergreen Street, and uh, Route 80 were also hot types of trails. Uh, there would have been a lot of fun activities to do during the summer in hot types of Kingston. Um, for example, sweat lodges were built in Blackwater Pond behind uh, the ball fields in Kingston. So the hot Texas would sit and sing songs in sweat lodges, then jump in the cool pond water and uh, cleanse their bodies with eagle fat and fish oil, which were natural bug repellents and uh, sunscreen. So, um, also in terms of natural solutions, um, sunflower bulbs, which uh, we have some right here, graciously uh, on the uh, Colchester Farm, Colchester Farm um, native to Kingston. Um, so they were, so sunflower bulbs were bo boiled whole and used as shampoo. Um, people use spider webs as a styptics to stop bleeding. Uh, people use birch bark and pine bark for burns, wood ashes to leave um, inflammation. Uh, people even made syringes using the hollow bladder of an animal for a bull. So the women of the tribe, who were the most knowledgeable at medicinal healing, um, they would collect the necessary herbs, roots, and barks, and would dry them carefully in the sun. But by the end of August, uh, the Plexi community would recongregate to Bay Farm area for the fall harvest. This is a very important time in uh, the year. So it was a way to kind of give thanks for the, the harvest um, to the land they received the harvest from and to celebrate the bounty um, that they received that year. Um, but it was also a, a time to celebrate and um, uh, you know, celebrate with your community. So community members would gather uh, in large groups, uh, have large feasts, there'd be dances, there'd be sporting events held at Bay Farm, and everyone would place bets on the competitors and teams. So there's an archery competition. Um, there's swimming endurance races off of, uh, you know, Bay Farm into the bay. 
There were um, foot races, and there was also a giant football game played between two teams. The winners of the football game um, would receive prizes donated by the many spectators. <laughs> um, and there was a lot of betting, of course, um, on which team would win. Uh, so there were feasts, and there was also the, uh, the column A dances, like the one we witnessed earlier in the service. Men families uh, would prepare to travel back to their winter community, and men would prepare for the fall haunt. Um, and this community would say goodbye to Caltex Kingston for the year. Um, so that was our town 500, 400 years ago. Uh, and I had mentioned the scholar Von DeLore Jr., um, and he once wrote that American Indians hold that their land places as having the highest possible meaning. Um, thousands of years of occupancy of their lands taught the tribal people the sacred landscape for which they were responsible. From this, gradually, the structure of ceremonial reality became clear. So the way I interpret that is that, um, first of all, the, the, he mentions thousands of years of occupancy, and this is um, correct for, for Kingston as well. Um, Kingston's been occupied by Native Americans for at least 10,000 years, and this is archaeologically uh, proven. Um, archaeologists have found at least one spearhead dating to the uh, Paleo times in um, Kingston history. So, um, it's a late uh, Eden Point, it's called. Um, it's a spearhead that's identified all over New England is from that era. Um, they found one in Kingston. So, um, but I love the terms that he uses, like ceremonial reality um, and sacred landscape. Um, I think it speaks to the way that the land and the way that the people living on the land um, interacted uh, and their beliefs with um, the way they, they had learned to survive. And it was kind of like a... Um, different way of looking at spirituality than, than um, European ways. But, um, so, what it, so what is the legacy of the Toxic Kingston? What is the legacy of this land that we're standing on right now? Um, and in my opinion, Toxic Kingston is not something that has disappeared. Um, the Harrington Wampanoag tribe are the, are the direct descendants of the Toxic people. And they're still a vibrant community that owns lands in the Patuxi territory still to this day. So they've continuously uh, maintained uh, their land in uh, Patuxi, what used to be Patuxi. Um, so not only are the Herring Pond, that their lands are now in Cedarville, um, which was part of the original Patuxi territory. So, but not only are the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe the direct descendants of the Patuxets, but they are the direct descendants of the Patuxets who chose to remain in Kingston land um, even after Europeans started taking over. So we know this because on March 16, 1667, um, Plymouth Colony town records state that a uh, liberty is granted by the town unto the Indian called Cossetan and his relations to improve a small parcel of land, about 10 acres, about Bracken Hill, which is in Ellisville, um, in Plymouth. So, like near the, so this later became the Herring Pond Wampanoag settlement. Um, and the connection between this and Kingston is that Cossetan's pond, which is sometimes called Crossman's Pond, um, is, is a pond in Kingston um, that's located behind Walking Road um, near the Thomas Willett House. And is according to um, historian Emily Drew, um, 20th century Kingston historian Emily Drew, this was named after Cossetan, um, the man, as I said, who's, who sued Plymouth and won the right to settle in Ellsville, um, Cedarville, which uh, is now where the Iron Fall Wampanoag tribe maintains their uh, tribe. So Kingston, Patuxet, uh, has a direct uh, legacy to the current tribe today. Um, 
And the, the chairwoman of the Harrington Wampanoag Tribe is currently on the board of directors at the Jones River Watershed Association, uh, which is in charge of conservation and stewardship of Kingston land and waterways. So far from having disappeared, the legacy of Patuxent Kingston is still uh, very much alive and active and evolving after 400 years of direct and indirect attempts to erase it from memory. Um, we were told time and time again in Kingston that Plymouth and Kingston were there for the taking uh, for the colonists who settled here because of an unfortunate early epidemic. Um, this is, in fact, a lie. Um, many perished from, um, from a plague that was spread by rats from European ships that infected plants and wildlife here, um, in which the Tuxel were really susceptible to. Um, in 1619, um, yet the Patuxets survived, and um, according to the Massachusetts Historical Society, had a substantial settlement even after this event, still in Kingston. So, um, yes, then a staggering number were killed and sold into slavery by the Europeans during and after King Philip's War, yet the Patuxet descendants survived. Yes, the tribes here faced legal discrimination and had their land placed in trusts owned by, the, by government officials who stole from them routinely, yet they survived. And um, recently, the, the Trump administration had tried to revoke um, one of the Wampanoag tribes' land trusts in order to take even more of their land and resources, um, yet they fought this and survived this too. So what is the legacy of Patuxent Kingston? It is resilient. The legacy of Patuxent Kingston is community. Patuxent Kingston is stewardship. Patuxent Kingston is friendship. Patuxent Kingston is respect for the interdependent web of all life. And Patuxent Kingston is still here. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Adam.